Hi there, my name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And this is the 50th lecture of the summer 2020 offering of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems. And in honor of this 50th lecture, I somehow messed up the input settings on my audio interface, and I wound up recording about the first 12 minutes of the lecture using the built-in microphone on my laptop. So the audio is going to be a bit terrible for about 12 minutes. It's still usable. And then at that point, I'll figure it out and switch to using the correct microphone. Normally, I would re-record that part of the video, but I don't really have time right now. So we're just going to roll with it. Just for a bit of context, let's talk about Butterworth filters. Now, there are many, many different analog filter types. There's Chevy Chef Type 1, Chevy Chef Type 2, elliptical. We're going to look at Butterworth just as one possible example of a common popular filter type. There are other signals and systems courses at other universities that spend a lot of time on different filter types. You can look up all of these various things on various websites if you want to or in various books. This is just to provide some context. Now for Butterworth filters, I'm going to draw a series of circles, which is incredibly dangerous because these circles, these are not z-plane unit circles. These are circles that have a radius of omega c. And they're only here because they happen to show up in the derivation of Butterworth filters. Recall that the important thing from the standpoint of frequency response is what is happening relative to poles and zeros near the imaginary axis. Most other filter designs aren't going to use this circle. The reason I drew these circles is that for a Butterworth filter, you essentially have poles that are equally spaced, except the poles on the right-hand side are sort of theoretical poles you briefly think about, but don't actually use because they're in the right-hand plane, and that will give you an unstable system. A Butterworth filter of order 2 will have two poles over here. A Butterworth filter of order 3 would sort of have six poles evenly spaced around the unit circle, but you don't actually use the poles on the right because poles on the right are bad news. So this would be for n equals 3. For n equals 4, to get them evenly spaced, you wind up doing something like this. And again, you could imagine some poles on the right to get that even spacing, but we don't use those because poles on the right are naughty. This isn't drawn terribly well. The idea of a Butterworth filter is just that these poles, including the ones over on the right-hand side, are all equally spaced in angle. But again, that is not a z-plane angle associated with the frequency, because this is not a z-plane thing. These are all s-plane representations. So we have a real part of s, and an imaginary part of s on everything, not z. No z going on here yet. These are analog filters that have a continuous time variable. So if we look at this in the frequency domain, the magnitude of one of these filters has the characteristic that for any particular n, they're all monotonically decreasing. We have a half power cutoff point that's at minus omega c. I'm drawing the magnitude here on a linear scale. So at what we're defining as the cutoff for a Butterworth filter, it's this 1 over square root of 2, well approximated by 0 0.707. That will be our half power point. And essentially, the name of the game with Butterworth filter is that for a given order, you'll get the steepest slope off you can that is still a monotonically decreasing function. I should also mention there's high-pass versions of this. We're doing a low-pass here. For lower orders, you'll still go through the same point at omega c, but the slope-off isn't going to be quite as fast. So if you really want to go for broke, really crank up that order and get a really steep cutoff. But there are issues with trying to implement very high-order filters in the analog domain even in the digital domain, but in the analog domain, if you're building these out of op amps and capacitors and resistors and or inductors, there's all sorts of weird effects that can come into play that become more difficult 
particularly dealing with component tolerance as the order the filter goes up, beyond just the extra expense of the parts you need to have more holes. For the purposes of 3084, you don't necessarily need to remember any of the details about a Butterworth filter. I'm not going to get into all of the various other typical analog filter types. Those are very well documented in a wide variety of books and lectures and websites, and you can go look up appropriate formulas and information as needed. I'm just showing this as an example to provide some context for the main topic of today's lecture, which is a technique for taking one of these nice analog filters and creating some sort of digital approximation. And here, when I put digital in the title of the lecture, I'm really largely doing that for the benefit of getting people to see the video according to terms they're likely to type into a search engine. Technically, what we're talking about here is how to create a discrete time filter that approximates a continuous time filter. There's no real requirement here that the vertical scale in time, i.e., whatever your units are, also need to be quantized to a certain number of bits to be stored in a computer. You can have discrete time filters with analog values, such as the bucket brigade devices used in chorus pedals and flanger pedals from the 1980s. Magnitude squared of a Butterworth filter response looks like 1 over 1 plus omega over omega c. This is the way you usually see it written, normalized like this to the power of 2n. And if you factor this out, then you get this particular evenly spaced hole placement. There's entire books on filter design. There's entire courses on filter design. The one they had at Georgia Tech is no longer taught, but you can go find the textbook for it. So here we'll create a discrete time approximation to a second order low pass Butterworth filter. This is one of the standard canonical second order filter types that we've looked at repeatedly. It has a damping factor of 1 over square root of 2 that places it on these 45 degree lines, the edge of starting to form a resonance bump. Remember from a few lectures ago that the poles of our two-pole system land at minus zeta omega n plus minus j omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So if we plug in 1 over square root of 2, we wind up with minus omega n over square root of 2 plus minus j omega n 1 half, because this would give me 1 minus a half. Oh, so I could just do this. Let's just write this as omega n over square root of 2. Let me put a P on here to remind us that it's a pole. Again, that's all just setting up an example. What we want to do is develop a technique that I'm going to label pole zero mapping for taking a continuous time filter and creating a discrete time approximation of it. Now, the discrete time approximation will not operate exactly like the original continuous time filter. And in fact, it can't because remember that a digital filter is going to be restricted to deal with frequencies that are less than half the sampling frequency. So here's the idea. We're going to create a discrete time filter with poles that are determined by taking the Laplace plane poles by the formula E to the SP times capital T sub S. And this is that mapping that we've looked at in the past three lectures. One thing we need to be careful about is that the z here does not stand for zero. z as in the z domain variable. It's a pole. Now, what makes this confusing is that this technique would do the same thing to the zeros. So here, I'm writing z sub z because this is the z domain. And then the subscript here would stand for zero. And we would run those through the same mapping. And so here, what we're doing is we're taking the S domain zeros, multiplying them by the sample period, and then taking E to the that. Now, this is not the only procedure out there for creating a discrete time filter from a continuous time prototype. If you take EC4270, assuming that I haven't sent you running screaming away from this field, 
you can learn about things like the bilinear transform and impulse invariance techniques that are, by a wide variety of criteria, better than what I'm showing you here. But this is nice because it fits that mapping that we've looked at for a while now. So at this point, we need to make some choices. Suppose that we'll have the cutoff frequency equal to the sample rate divided by 4. Notice the highest that omega c could possibly be would be omega s over 2 because that's the highest frequency you can even represent at all in the discrete time signal. And technically, we need this inequality to be strict. And also, practically, it should stay way away from there. And we'll see that a little bit later. The closer your cutoff frequency is to this half of your sampling frequency, the more weird stuff goes on. I certainly can't have omega c be bigger than this because then omega c itself would be in a range that's aliased. So running through this mapping of the poles, I'll have zp equal e to the, and I'm going to write this out as exp, just so I'm not trying to write all this stuff super tiny in the superscript. So I'll have minus omega s over 4 square root of 2 plus minus j omega s over 4 square root of 2. All of this times ts, which I'm going to write as 2 pi over omega s, the sample rate in radians per second. So that's going to be 2 pi over omega s. So let's see what happens here. The omega s's politely cancel. And then the 2 and the 4 are going to give me minus 1 over 2 square root of 2 plus minus j 1 over 2 square root of 2. And there is this pi here that I can pull in. So I'll put pi on top of everything. And at this point, I don't really need two levels of grouping. So I'll just write this as parentheses. OK, so I can split this into exp minus pi over 2 square root of 2 times exp plus minus j pi over 2 square root of 2. I only had two poles here, so they are complex conjugate pairs, so this wasn't too notationally tricky. Just remember that this zp and this sp represent sequentially plugging in all of the poles that you have, and you'll do a similar step with all of the zeros. So I just now realized that although for the past half hour I've thought I've been talking into my usual Electro Voice RE320 microphone through the Manly Vox box and into the computer, I've actually been recording through the laptop microphone, and the laptop is a couple of feet to my right. Normally, I would actually redo this entire lecture using proper sound, but don't really have time right now, so I apologize for that. The audio is understandable, it just doesn't sound very professional. Sorry about that. Anyway, if you take these expressions and plug them into your calculator, you'll get 0 0.3293 times e to the j plus minus 1.1107. And if you wanted to write this in our usual polar form, but in terms of degrees, you'll get 63.64. So in terms of where the poles land, uh, let's be careful because this now actually is a unit circle because this is the z-plane. Let's see, 0.3 is about a third of the way out from the origin to the unit circle. And the 63 degrees, let me put a degrees on here actually. So that should put our poles somewhere, so let's see, so this would be a 60 degree. Okay, so these would be 60 degrees, and we're going about a third of the way out. So how about let's put a pole here and one here, roughly speaking. So that's where the poles go. If you start with these poles on the S-plane, again, the fact that there's a circle here, don't let that confuse you. This is not a Z-plane thing. The circle is just specific to the Butterworth. Anyway, you take those poles, you run them through this mapping, and they land here. The main point is this now gives you something that you can actually implement. The transfer function of the discrete time system we derived using the pole zero method would look something like this. We'll have two poles, 
And let me write them in this factored form first. So I'll write a z minus 1 and a 1 minus z p2 to the z minus 1, where the numbers represent the two poles of our system. In this case, they're complex conjugates of each other. So notice this is different in style than how we would usually write a factor transfer function for a Laplace transform. For something like that, we would usually write an s minus wherever the pole is, something like this. But it's very convenient when you're dealing with z transforms to stick the pole and the z to the minus 1 together like this. So all I'm going to do on the next line is just substitute in the values we found. So we had 1 minus 0 0.3293 e to the j 1.1107. And then we have 1 minus the same thing, except it's complex conjugate. So this factored form is the way that it's most convenient to think about in terms of thinking about the frequency response. But if we want to implement this discrete time system, we actually want to multiply out the denominator. And if you do that, you wind up with 1 over 1 minus 0 0.2924 z to the minus 1 plus 0 0.1084 z to the minus 2. And remember, our transfer function is y of z over x of z, where x is the input and y is the output. You'll remember from 2026, if you are a Georgia Tech EC student who has taken 2026, that you can cross multiply this expression, move terms that involve delayed versions of the time domain signal over on the same side as the input x, and you'd wind up with y of n is equal to 0. 2924y n minus 1 minus 0.1084y n minus 2 plus x of n. And this is two things. It is a difference equation that describes a mathematical truth. It also incidentally implies an algorithm for figuring out what y of n is based on the past outputs and the current input. And what would we do with this knowledge? Well, we would build a system with this transfer function PZM. We would stick an analog to digital converter on one end, a digital to analog converter on the other. The user would put in an x of t and get out a y of t. And hopefully this would be close enough to the original analog system that we're modeling um, that the user won't notice the difference. So we could define an effective frequency response in terms of an omega without the hat, in terms of a standard frequency for continuous time signals instead of discrete time signals. And the way we would get this is we could take our z domain function and then plug e to the j omega hat into it e to the j omega hat to get a discrete time frequency response, but then evaluate this at omega hat equals either omega over the sampling rate in hertz, or we could write this as 2 pi omega over omega s. We could go ahead and substitute that in here. Let's write this as big H PZM e to the j 2 pi omega over omega s. Come to think of it, I think when I write code, I tend to use this form. Anyway, if you're lucky, this is going to be a decent approximation. If you plot these in MATLAB, they're not going to line up exactly. How good they are depends on how high the sample rate is sort of relative to the main passband of your filter. If your filter has a lot of action going on up near half the sampling frequency, which is nearing the limit, it's going to have trouble with that. You're going to plot these and see that there's some big differences going on. But that's the sort of thing you can always fix by raising the sample rate if you're able to do that without uh, spending a lot more money on faster A to D and D to A converters or more processing power. In any case, part of the contract for any of this to make sense is that whatever frequencies are going in, need to be less than half the sample rate. Let me write it here in hertz, too, just because that's how 
musicians will generally prefer to think of things.